Recently, dopamine became one of the most sinister chemical in our brain. I'm directly challenging you to join me and hundreds of other people to do a dopamine detox this By Sunday. By fasting, you're removing all sources of dopamine from your life. You need to look at everything in your life that triggers dopamine and just get it out of people there. People say we need to reduce our dopamine activities because it stops you from achieving your goals, doing hard things, and it makes you less focused and productive. So we need dopamine detox or dopamine fasting. If you hear the specifics, it sounds that dopamine or the activities that increase dopamine must be bad and it can ruin your life. Hot new health trend. This year is no different. There is a new style of fasting and it involves your brain. Dopamine fasting is quickly becoming one of the ways to unplug from the things that can cause anxiety, depression, even heart disease. Now, as you can imagine, chasing dopamine can be a dangerous path. Many people cling to their smartphones and social media because they're searching for their next source of dopamine. But the other neurotransmitters you have to cultivate to balance things out are called the here and now neurotransmitters. Okay, here and now. And what those ones are, are serotonin, endorphins, oxytocin, GABA. These are neurotransmitters that allow you to enjoy the present moment. They allow you to feel peace, satisfaction, calmness. Those allow us to enjoy the present moment, okay? And the way that you can detox this, it's called a dopamine detox, is really the solution for this. Mode where I, I drop all uh, dopamine triggering things and I just work and work and work and learn and learn and learn. And actually when I'm in that state, I know I'm happiness. I feel the best. I feel the best around people. I feel the best in my life. I feel the best with my progress. I'm, I'm very happy. But is it really the case? And does dopamine detox really exist? So let's cut to the chase. I think we should start with this overused statement that dopamine is a neurotransmitter. To understand what a neurotransmitter is, first we should understand how exactly the neural cells in our body work. Neurons are specialized to transfer signals in our body and their general shape is like this. Dendrite receive electric signals from other neural cells to the cell body and the axon transmit the signals away to other neurons. The functional connection between these cells is called synapses and there is a space between two neurons which we call synaptic cleft. The crosstalk between these neural cells is carried out by neurotransmitters which synthesize and store in the vesicles in the presynaptic neuron. The vesicles fuse with the membrane at the axon terminal and release the neurotransmitter to the synaptic cleft, where they insert their effects through a specialized receptors on the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron. Let's assume a neurotransmitter like glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter, released from a presynaptic neuron. There is a channel on the postsynaptic neurons which glutamate binds to. Normally, the concentration of inside and outside of the cell's ions are kept constant and the voltage of the cells are minus 70 millivolts, which we call it resting potential. After the interaction of glutamate with its receptor, the channel opens and positive ions like sodium or calcium flow into the cell. If the stimulation is strong enough and the postsynaptic potential reaches the minus 55 millivolt, it triggers a special sodium channel to open, which responds to this exact voltage. After it opens, positive sodium ions flow into the cells and increase the electric potential of this part of the cells. We call this depolarizing and the voltage inside of the cell reaches positive 30 millivolt. This voltage triggers the sodium gated channel to close immediately. At this point, two things happen. One is that the positive sodium ions reach the next sodium gated channel and the cycle repeats. The other one is that the positive 30 millivolt voltage activates the potassium gated channel. Potassium ions leave the cells and makes the cell more negative, about minus 90 millivolt. This is how electric signals transmit through the axon. When the action potential reaches the terminal of an axon, it triggers the calcium voltage gated channels to open. So calcium ions can enter the cell. They're responsible for the fusion of the vesicles with the cell membrane and release the neurotransmitter, which in our case dopamine, into the synaptic cleft. Dopamine connects to its receptors at the postsynaptic neurons and inserts its effect. This is where things start to get more complicated, because in contrast to what most people think, dopamine doesn't always excite the postsynaptic neurons. Dopamine has two different family receptors, D1-like family receptors and D2-like family receptors. These receptors are what we call the G-protein couple receptors. They're proteins inside of the cell membrane and they connect to the three subtypes inside the cell. One of them is alpha. There are four types of alpha and they can start different intracellular signaling pathways, which at the end, they increase or decrease a molecule, which we call the second messenger. 
This second messenger can start a series of reactions that change the gene expression of the postsynaptic neurons. It means that it can turn on or turn off some of the genes in the postsynaptic neurons. For example, the D1-like family receptors activate the G-alpha-S, which activate an enzyme called adenylcyclase. This enzyme increases a second messenger called CAMP. On the other hand, the D2-like receptors activate the inhibitory type of alpha, which inhibits the formation of CAMP by inhibiting the adenylcyclase. That's one side of the complex story of dopamine. The other side is that the dopamine receptors can make combination with each other or even other receptors. For example, D2 receptors can make a combination with the D1 receptors. The combination of D1 and D2 can activate G-alpha-Q11, which activates phospholipase C and subsequently release the intracellular calcium. I don't want to get into more details and I want to save it for another video, but what I'm trying to say is that the effect of dopamine on our nervous system is so much more complex than we think and dopamine doesn't do a single job in our neural cells. Dopaminergic neurons create different pathways in the brain. One of them is called the mesolimbic pathway which transmits signals via dopamine from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens. Sometimes it's called the reward pathway because it plays a major role in reward related cognition. But somehow, most people don't mention the broader term, which is motivational salience. This is a cognitive process in our brain that forms some kind of focus and attention to a special object or a stimulus. So this is how it works. If a stimulus happens, for example, you see an object or hear sound, which is different from other stimuli, it starts a process in you to organize your behavior towards the stimulus if it's rewarding. But if it's not, it makes you change your behaviors to move away from the stimulus. And at the same time, it reinforces that behavior to make sure that you're going to repeat the behavior every time. So dopamine plays a major role in both reward-related cognition and aversive-related cognition. So it doesn't always about the reward, but also about the punishment too. So what is a reward? Reward comes from a system in our body called homeostasis, which tries to balance out different variables in our body such as body temperature or blood sugar level. For example, if your body needs water, you got thirsty. If you learn that your refrigerator can give you that, the reward circuit reinforces this behavior that whenever you got thirsty, you do the same behavior over and over again. The water is what we call the primary reward, which comes from the internal and homeostasis system of the body. In contrast, money isn't rewarding by itself, but we learn in our life that it can be associated or conditioned with primary rewards. That's why most conditioned rewards are completely subjective. For example, someone may love to listen to a piece of music, but the other one may hate that music and never listen to it again, which both involve dopaminergic pathways in our brain. So dopamine, other than motivational salience, involves in learning and memory too. So it helps you with your future decision and it's updating your information and behaviors towards a stimulus. To understand how it works, first let's play a game together. I'm just giving you two different cards to choose from. If you choose a card and win $100, this is a surprise better than expected, right? Next time hoping for another $100 and you pick another card and you win $200. That would be another surprise for you, which is great. So there's a question here for you. Do you want to play the same game again with me? You probably predict that you're going to win $300 since your experience tells you that and you're good at math. You pick a card and you lose $1000 instead. What are you going to do now? This is how it works. Every time you just evaluate different things and make prediction about how much they can be rewarding and when you experience them you compare the points of your prediction and the actual reward that you got. If the positive difference is high, the probability that you're going to repeat the same behavior is pretty high. And if the negative difference is high, you're not going to do it again. That's called reward prediction error, and you do it all the time with every decision that you make in your life. That's actually how you learn different things in your life, and these pieces of information are storing your memory so you can use them again in the future to help you update your predictions. This mechanism is built in us by evolution that pushes us to learn from our mistakes because we hate negative reward prediction errors and we try to change our behavior to get more positive reward prediction errors. That brings us to the popular choice between carrot and chocolate. If the brain compares the chocolate to the carrot and nine times out of 10, you're gonna go to the chocolate because comparatively, 
the chocolate gives you more dopamine than the carrot. The chocolate seems like a better option to your brain, to your default evolutionary brain than the carrot. So you're gonna go for the chocolate. As soon as you're standing in front of your fridge and you have the choice to either pick a carrot or a piece of chocolate, your brain will tell you to pick the one which releases more dopamine as it knows that it will make you feel more pleasure. So naturally, you will choose the chocolate. People say because chocolate increases more dopamine compared to carrot, every time you choose the chocolate, which is incredibly wrong and oversimplified, the reward circuitry is not the only circuitry involved in making our choices. It's way more complex than that, and other factors play important roles. Let's assume you have two stimuli to choose from. Your brain can calculate different variables related to each choice. These calculations are based on the crosstalk between different brain regions and neural circuits, which a variety of neurotransmitters play crucial roles. As I said before, the VTA transmits signals to the nucleus accumbens in the mesolimbic pathway. The glutamate and acetylcholine activate the dopaminergic neurons in VTA and nucleus accumbens. On one hand, hippocampus transmits contextual information to the nucleus accumbens, which plays a major role in creating and storage of memories. So it brings all the contextual information that you learned before to the table. On the other hand, the amygdala, which is a center for the formation and storage of memories related to emotional events, both positive and negative, plays a central role in your decision. For example, if you had a bad experience with a certain stimulus which was aversive to you, it adds a fear component and risk factors to your decision. The other things which makes it even more complicated is the effect of another dopaminergic pathway called the mesocortical pathway. In this pathway, VTA transmits signals via dopamine to the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is responsible for executive functions, which means it orchestrates thought and actions towards a defined goal. So it's a powerful tool that helps you predict an outcome of a decision, plan and execute different actions, and it can send outputs to the nucleus accumbens. Prefrontal cortex with the help of the anterior cingulate cortex is responsible for the effort computation. So they calculate the time and effort that you need to achieve a special goal. Now let's talk about this thing that people call dopamine detox or dopamine fasting. First, there is no research on dopamine detox or dopamine fasting per se. You can just find a word on randomized clinical studies or just molecular or even behavioral studies. Dopamine detox or dopamine fasting is just the worst choice of a word. It's just wrong. Plus, when you talk about a certain type of practice, the criteria of that practice should be clear because it causes misunderstanding and it may do more harm than good. I think I watched the majority of dopamine detox or fasting content on the web and I found that many people randomly talk about different points that are not necessarily related to each other. One of them is removing dopamine from the body. Based on what we discussed before, we know that's impossible things to do. It's not just reasonable to think that you are in control of your neurotransmitters. You can't just remove the neurotransmitters. They're responsible for many things in our brain and you need them for the proper functions of your brain. One famous example is the role of dopamine on executive functions and movements in Parkinson's disease because the dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra die and it leads to dopamine deficiency. The other one is that people talk about removing all the activities that increase dopamine, which is an impossible thing to do because our behaviors, executive functions and learning are based on dopamine and most of the stimuli increase other neurotransmitters at the same time. For example, glutamate is responsible for increasing dopamine in the first place. So, do you want to remove that too? Interestingly, many people believe that dopamine fasting is fasting from everything. They would not eat food, they would not exercise, they wouldn't engage in sexual activities, they don't go outside because the sun is a stimulant. No music, no work, no relationship, no talking, and no eye contact. That's called sensory deprivation, which was developed by some of the armed forces within NATO for interrogation because removing all of the stimuli results in hallucination, depression, and extreme anxiety. In my opinion, reducing high stimulant activities such as porn, social media, and video game for 24 to 72 hours is helpful, and some people do sensory deprivation on a regular basis for a limited time in the isolation tanks. Regarding overstimulation in the modern world, it could be relaxing and beneficial in some sense, but it doesn't do anything in the case of your dopamine level or even dopamine receptors in this limited time frame. One of the homeostasis response to the excessive amount of a neurotransmitter in long periods of time is to build up tolerance by reducing the number of receptors on the postsynaptic neurons. Reset the tolerance level of a particular receptors in our brain take weeks or even months.
I think the issue that started such practice is the concern over increasing impulsive behavior in the modern world. Nevertheless, we still have a scientific name for it, and it's impulsive control. Impulsive behavior is engagement in behavior without thinking about the consequences, which shows that receptors and neural circuits are messed up in terms of reward-related cognition and decision-making. We know that the prefrontal cortex can affect the nucleus accumbens, which makes these two dopaminergic pathways constantly at war. So what's happening over time is that your mesolimbic pathway dominant your mesocortical pathway. Actually, at this point, exercise and meditation can help because both of them can make the prefrontal cortex stronger. The other things that can happen is that the anterior cingulate cortex and effort computation doesn't work properly, and individuals always choose to engage in low effort, low reward behaviors rather than high effort, high reward behaviors. So I'm not saying that social media and high stimulant activities in the modern world are good and definitely you shouldn't surround yourself with them all the time. They absolutely have their positive and negative effect on us but what I'm trying to say is that simplifying such complex behaviors and connect them to a neurotransmitter is misleading. And that's the reason we observe impulsive behaviors in extreme cases in which they try to remove essential behaviors such as eating exercising, sex, and even talking. At the end of this, there's much deeper facets that you need to spend the entire day, no coffee, no sex, no shopping, no talking. I've seen people cut conversations short because they don't want to get too much dopamine. <laughs> and look, that's taking out of hand. It's missing the point. It's, I think, anything that gives that's us That's like going a to a you're, ha you're having, That's like you're, becoming a You're literally in the middle of yeah. hey, I can I'm, see I'm you, you're having sex out, with, yeah. with your wife, and five minutes in, you're like, I'm sorry, honey, I, I'm, I only have five minutes of dopamine today. <laughs> We're going to have to resume this tomorrow.